and it's on these uh, uh, new types of uh, uh, molecules called trilobite molecules, which are uh, formed in an interesting way. They're formed basically by the scattering of a Rydberg uh, electron off of a perturber that finds itself within the Rydberg atom wave function. Um, this is picture here is a picture of the trilobite part of our um, wave function for our molecules. Um, so basically, this is the electron uh, density of uh, uh, subtracted, well, of the electron density uh, of uh, the electron, uh, and it's the non uh, S wave part of that electron density. So you can see kind of the residual here, S wave wave function here that's kind of uh, perturbed a little bit and left over from the subtraction. And then you can see the little part here um, that's left over. So this is kind of similar to the figure that, uh, that Robert showed you. Um, the difference between, or at least one difference between um, these uh, molecules in cesium that I'm going to talk about today and the ones that have been uh, studied uh, in rubidium is that this is about um, 100, times, uh, 100 times larger than in the rubidium case studied so far. So there's a lot more trilobite character to these molecules, and that's something that's a little bit special um, about uh, cesium. And uh, uh, this work is done in collaboration with uh, Hossein Sajipur and uh, Seth Rittenhouse here at ITAM. So there's been a lot of work in ultra-cold uh, Rydberg atom physics recently. Um, a lot of it's from things that uh, Ed Eiler talked about yesterday, and that you can get uh, Rydberg atom dipole blockade because you have very strong long-range interactions between um, Rydberg atoms, which is a result of their very high polarizability. And uh, another interesting thing about that is that those interactions are somewhat controllable by applying electric fields. Um, so that's led to uh, you know, other types of molecule formation, a lot of quantum optics uh, type experiments. And that's still a really active field. But another part of that field is um, looking for exotic states of matter, and uh, I think trilobite uh, molecules qualify as one of those. And I would even argue that um, this type of molecule is uh, held together by a new bonding mechanism. And I'll try to give you a feel for um, how that uh, bonding takes place and why it's a little bit different than uh, in a normal molecule, which is, say, as a, a covalent or uh, kind of a purely ionic bond. And then uh, another unique feature of these is that they have really large dipole moments. And the molecules in rubidium that have been discovered that are of the same type have a dipole moment of about a single to bi, uh, which is large. But um, the states that I'm going to talk about have a dipole moment of about 30 to bi. And that's just uh, a difference that's a direct result of uh, the fact that uh, there's more of that uh, trilobite-like wave function uh, in the states that uh, we're looking at, okay? So I'll tell you a little about the electric field dependence here. It's a bit more complicated um, for reasons you'll understand later. I'll show you uh, how we detect these experimentally and maybe try to give you a better feel for um, uh, how you should think about the molecules and how they're formed. Um, and then kind of maybe talk about, um, you know, how this relates to ion pair states and maybe uh, you know, future directions for, for this work. So um, Hossein, Chris Green, and Alan Dickinson uh, predicted uh, the existence of these things in ultra-cold gases. I think all of them in previous uh, research endeavors had kind of uh, been interested in, in potentials that have uh, a lot of oscillations in them, so uniquely shaped potentials. And they realized that um, in these ultra-cold gases that if you had a ground state perturber that you found within the wave function of the uh, Rydberg atom electron, that um, under certain conditions you could uh, form a weak bond. And the condition <coughs> basically is, is that you can kind of think of uh, that event up here as a scattering event. And so uh, what happens is then the Rydberg electron will scatter off of the ground state atom. And uh, if that uh, interaction there, if the scattering length is negative, then the uh, ground state atom, which for the alkalis is highly polarizable, will be attracted slightly to the electron. And then these two will kind of 
have a, a weak kind of sticking. And of course, since the electron's still bound to the Rydberg atom core, then this forms basically a molecule or a molecular bond. And so um, kind of the idea of a new bonding mechanism is this is kind of a, a, a different type of, of uh, molecular bond. The way I like to think about it in a cartoon picture is that um, if this guy is a fisherman, he sends out his lure here, and then he gets the big fish to just bite on it, and then he can kind of haul him in. And that's kind of how it is, as if the scattering length for this process is negative, then um, these two guys get attracted a little bit, and that's what's forming the bond. The bonds are fairly weak on the scale of uh, kind of chemical bonding, but in an ultra-cold gas, using photoassociation, you can, um, you can see those because this happens at long range. Okay. So um, in 2009, when I was in Stuttgart, we observed these molecules, and we observed them in rubidium, and we observed S-states, which are not the, the kind of true trilobite molecules here that have the highly distorted wave function, which implies that the electron spends a lot of time here on the ground state atom, and then that forms a, a huge uh, dipole moment. Okay, But it was later found in subsequent work that uh, indeed, there was a little bit, as Robert described, a little bit of this kind of trilobite-like wave function in this S-wave wave function from the scattering here. And then you could get uh, a rather large dipole moment for a, for a uh, homonuclear diatomic, which would be uh, one to buy. Okay. So how does that work, really? Um, that's a cartoon picture of what happens and kind of the way that people who work with these think about it. Well. What you have is an uh, interaction between the electron and the ground state atom, which is a polarization interaction. And that's what this is. This is just means that the electron is polarizing um, the ground state atom, and the ground state atom has a high polarizability. And this can lead to, in this potential, uh, a negative scattering length or a positive scattering length at low energy. The, the scattering is supposed to happen at long range where the electron's traveling uh, kind of at low velocity. And uh, that's the way you can use a pseudo, or that's why you can use a pseudo potential to describe the scattering, which is what Robert said. Um, and so, if the if the scattering length is negative, there's an attraction. If it's positive, then there's repulsion, and there's no bond that will form. Okay. So, um, at first, uh, we just try to describe that as uh, a delta function perturber using this kind of Fermi pseudo potential method, and with a basically a kinetic energy dependent uh, scattering length. And uh, you can use classical, and still do use classical um, physics in the Coulomb potential to uh, determine what that kinetic energy is. And then you use the real um, electron uh, ground state atom scattering data to uh, determine what that scattering length is as a function of that energy. You can do that for um, the S wave scattering, which is this. So basically, uh, very low energy scattering. Um, it turns out that for the, for the kind of trilobite molecules that I'm talking about here and the ones that were discovered in Stuttgart, um, you also need to include the P wave scattering, which then has a slightly different form. It basically depends on the gradient of the wave function at the point of the perturber. Okay. Um, so uh, what that scattering gives you then uh, is basically a perturbed Rydberg wave function that has uh, uh, kind of a shape like this. Okay. So you have mostly uh, in these molecules so far uh, an S wave Rydberg wave function plus some other piece from the scattering uh, off of the perturber that's in, uh, in the uh, uh, electron uh, orbit of the, the Rydberg atom. Um, if you just do the simple theory, this is for rubidium, this is kind of the first stuff that we did, um, you get these weird oscillating potentials. And um, if you look at them, you say the binding energy is not that great. If you add the P waves in and Rydberg interactions and stuff, uh, this stuff comes down in a, in a much more complicated way. And that calculation is where um, kind of we need help to do, because we're not good enough theorists to do that. Um, but uh, this kind of qualitatively gives you uh, a good idea of what's happening at the, at the farthest uh, ranges. 
So when the perturber is sitting out near the uh, near the kind of highest extent of the the Rydberg orbit, um, the oscillation comes from the fact that the pseudo potential depends on the uh, electron density squared times that delta function. That's the term in the that's the energy term. And so since that electron density oscillates, then the potential oscillates. Okay, and you can get binding, of course, uh, in these long range wells. So um, these guys are not all that easy to observe because they're not bound by that much. That's kind of why you need uh, high resolution lasers and you also um, kind of, you need uh, a system that's cold and because collisions will just uh, destroy them for one reason. Um, so uh, also uh, in uh, kind of a normal ultra cold gas that you would create with say a MOT where the densities are around uh, 10 to the 10 per cubic centimeter, 10 to the 11th per cubic centimeter. Um, the fact that these wells for kind of the uh, states that are kind of uh, have reasonably deep wells, uh, this is not really that long of range. So we talked a little bit about this yesterday and that the pair distribution function doesn't really favor you too heavily uh, even at these ranges here. And so you need to have higher densities. Um, it also helps, again, like I said, to have uh, a cold sample. But um, in practice, uh, the uh, experiments in Stuttgart happen kind of more towards the 10 to the 14 per cubic centimeter uh, density, and it's hard to detect these. And in our experiments, it's also hard to detect these things, and we're working more towards the couple by 10 to the 13 per cubic centimeter. So that gets you down to a, a pair separation of of something like maybe like 500 nanometers or 300 nanometers, somewhere in there. Um, so that does matter. Uh, I guess that's uh, kind of all for that. And so um, these experiments uh, have to take place in kind of denser traps than, than a magneto-optic trap. I mean, if you want to get good, good signals, which are small even in our setup. So, our approach to solving this problem, because we don't have a BEC machine, and I don't want to build a BEC machine, um, is to use a cross-dipole trap, okay? And so um, the idea is that uh, you can trap atoms in a conservative potential. You can uh, cool them and you load them into this uh, conservative potential. And by pushing more atoms in there in the dark, you can get higher densities than in the MOT. And, uh, that's kind of shown here. You can use a single focus beam, and that will get you up to something like 10 to the 12 per cubic centimeter. But if you use uh, a crossed dipole trap with a little bit more, um, uh, basically, compression so that the uh, trap frequencies are a little bit higher, um, you can get uh, much higher densities, you know, up to the few by 10 to the 13 per cubic centimeter. And that's kind of uh, shown here. This is the uh, lifetime of the single dipole trap, which is dominated by uh, uh, background collisions within the chamber. And then you see that if we do the cross trap, uh, the lifetime is actually decreased. And that's because you're getting to densities where now you're going to get three body recombination of the cold atoms in the trap. That starts to uh, take over as the biggest loss process. So the machine that we use uh, to do this is basically uh, we have a, a vapor cell MOT that we use to load this cross dipole trap uh, that's located in the center of a uh, time of flight spectrometer with MCP plates down here. And then we cross that with our excitation lasers and uh, to do an experimental cycle, which I'll kind of show in a bit more detail here, we have to create this trap, uh, get those densities, and then um, we shoot laser pulses at it. and measure the ions that come down and, and hit the detector here. And we do that as a function of frequency, of the laser frequency for the excitation. <clears throat> the temperature is about 40 microkelvin. Um, this is the expansion of the dipole trap. Um, once you get to kind of temperatures that are basically like this, the experiment works fine. Um, if it was 2 microkelvin versus, you know, maybe 100 microkelvin, I don't think it would matter. Um, but overall, here's the parameters. So we're working in like a, basically a 100 micron uh, spot size, and the trap has a, 
length of about uh, 200 microns. The trap depth is of like one and a half millikelvin, uh, 40 microkelvin. We get about two times 10 to the 13 per cubic centimeter for the density, which is important, which gives us a spacing of about 500 nanometers, which is kind of near the outer, um, the kind of uh, outer part of those wells that I showed earlier in the kind of idealized calculation, let's say. The price we pay for the fort um, is not nothing. Um, the fort is a, is a focused beam of 1064 nanometer light. And when you excite Rydberg atoms in that, uh, you can ionize them. And uh, basically, this is a comparison of the natural lifetime in just a magneto-optic trap with no 1064 focus light. And then this is the lifetime of the Rydberg atoms as a function of principal quantum number uh, when you put them in the, uh, the uh, far-off resonant dipole trap. And you can see that the lifetime decreases by about 20%. This is kind of an important measurement for us to make to see if we could do the experiment. And um, it turns out that you can. In fact, um, for our setup, uh, you'll see in a second here that we can't use pulse field ionization just because of some technical issues with uh, how much field we can apply to the extraction plates. So in our experiment, we're actually using um, this effect to detect the Rydberg atoms that we excite. So we're letting the 1064 nanometer light ionize um, the, the Rydberg atoms as we create them. Okay, so um, as you saw in Robert's talk, the lines for these are very, located very close to the asymptote, um, and you need to have very narrow bandwidth lasers to kind of separate the, the spectra, the spectral features. And so we use uh, a two-photon off-resonant excitation um, to uh, excite these guys. So uh, we use a laser that's tuned close to the 6p3 halves transition, uh, but it's uh, detuned by something like 100 to 200 megahertz, depending on uh, the experiment. And then we use a green laser at 509 nanometers, or you know, around that to uh, excite up into uh, the Rydberg states, to excite the Rydberg atoms. And our two photon line width, um, this was actually a good day. This is 1.8 megahertz, but it's about uh, two and a half megahertz, uh, uh, pretty much on, on average. Um, the other thing that you need, because the lines are spaced rather close together, and you'll see that our, um, our uh, uh, spectra are spaced by a bit more than uh, in the Stuttgart experiment. They're more like 100 megahertz or 50 megahertz apart. Um, to kind of uh, locate exactly where those lines are, uh, we need a good frequency reference to do that. And we use electromagnetically induced transparency in a, in a cesium cell to do that. It provides a bunch of markers from the different uh, hyperfine states. If we uh, operate the uh, EIT cell in a co and counter propagating probe configuration, if we detune the uh, probe laser, I'm sorry, pump laser in co and counter propagating uh, configuration, if we detune the probe laser from the transition, then we talk to different velocity groups in, the, uh, in this cell, and we get resonances that are uh, displaced by known amounts that are related to um, how much that detuning is. And that can be done very precisely, uh, of course, with an AOM. And so this will give us about six uh, peaks that look like this that are spaced by, as you can see here, this is uh, 120 megahertz. So um, we have some good uh, markers uh, in the spectra to uh, tell if the lasers are drifting uh, and things like that, which is kind of important. We don't need something like a, since we're not scanning over large ranges, we don't need like a, a Fabry Perot to count fringes or something like this, which would be hard to get fringes that were really spaced by that much. So um, here's the way that we do the experiment, as I somewhat briefly described before. Um, we prepare our trap that takes about two seconds, and then we start shooting excitate green, ex green and red excitation pulses at it, um, uh, each uh, 10 microseconds long. Uh, the uh, dipole trap is left on, and that just naturally ionizes the uh, Rydberg atoms. And uh, at that time, uh, well, after, after the pulse is over, then we 
uh, pulse the electric field plates to extract the, the ions that we created, and then we detect them on this time of flight, uh, in this time of flight spectrometer. We look for uh, cesium plus and cesium two plus. Um, in our experiment, we haven't observed very much cesium two plus, um, and we don't really understand uh, how that relates to the, the rubidium experiments right now. That's a little bit open. So this shows like the uh, three signals. This is the cesium plus signal as a function of frequency around the, the Rydberg state. This is one of our EIT reference peaks. And then this is a reference line taken in the MOT. Uh, we also probe the MOT when it's there. So this is where the, the, uh, this is where the uh, Rydberg peak is. Uh, just in the magneto-optic trap, unshifted by the AC star shift of the dipole trap. And so we can measure these frequencies given the EIT peak here and the line width of the MOT to figure out what the two-photon line width of the, uh, of the lasers are in any run. And um, if you do that and look at, for example, a, a state, a triplet state, uh, that correlates to 39S and then the 6S, the ground state of cesium, uh, you'll get a spectra that kind of looks like this and you can kind of position it uh, very well in frequency. And the things to note here that are uh, interesting are this guy right here, this little lump over here, and some of the structure on the, on the back side here. A lot of that um, is from uh, cesium trilobites. But the other thing that's interesting here is you see stuff on the blue side of this line and that's the stuff that I'm going to talk about, but for lower uh, end. Because if you remember um, from Robert's talk, the molecules that were uh, discovered in Stuttgart, the rubidium molecules, they actually correlated to um, the uh, NS uh, ground state S uh, potential. The molecules that I'm going to talk about are to the blue side of that. And in cesium, um, a unique thing happens because if there's a low, um, basically, S-state differential uh, quantum defect, um, the S-states are almost degenerate with uh, the N minus four uh, hydrogenic states. And so what that enables is that when this electron comes around and scatters on the ground state atom, that's why we're getting so much more trilobite characters, because it's mixing in um, the high L states from the scattering process. Um, and so uh, that's the first thing that's kind of unique about cesium and why um, these states are interesting. We still have a lot of S character, and the S character is what's allowing us to excite the uh, trilobite molecule. It's the thing that's carrying the oscillator strength for, the, for what is more or less a, a photo association process. Here's a kind of picture of that, this is kind of uh, showing some of the, comp or the, the stuff that I didn't cover in the basic cartoon picture of how these things form. Um, this is a calculation by Seth and Hossein for the 30, for uh, states around the 39S Rydberg state. And what you can see is that you get these high angular momentum states that come down here and form avoided crossings with um, the 39S uh, Rydberg state asymptote. So this asymptote is really 39S plus 6S. Okay, and this potential is that too. Um, and so uh, these guys are really interesting because of the ones that have larger dipole moments because they'll have more of this hydrogenic character. So those are the ones that we spent our time investigating. Um, from the simple model, there's a couple complications. I told you about this right here, and this gives us about 1% uh, hydrogenic. Uh, character into the wave function, which gives us the uh, dipole moment. And we also had to take into account um, these, you know, the P wave, just as in the Stuttgart stuff, to really get the true potential. And that was a bit too hard for us, so uh, Hossein and Seth worked that out. Um, in cesium, there's also these scattering residences, which are important, which also is contributing to that 1% uh, of hydrogenic character, basically giving us this uh, this mixing in here and these avoided crossing, these strong avoided crossings, which um, uh, give us the states that we're looking at. Here's uh, a scan to the blue side of the Rydberg line. The Rydberg line's over here. 
here is the e here are two of the EIT uh, reference lines um, from the EIT cell, and then these four arrows mark uh, the positions of uh, four lines from the trilobite molecules from wells that are formed by that avoided crossing uh, near uh, the asymptote. And you can see that they're basically located, you know, 50, 100, 175, 200 megahertz away from the, the Rydberg state on that order. Um, another thing that's different here is that the lines are a bit broader, so they're more like 20 megahertz instead of um, basically the lifetime of the uh, Rydberg state. Um, we think that's due to two things. Well, for sure it's due to the fact that the uh, AC star shift will give us 11 megahertz lines just from the being in the far off resonance dipole trap. Um, and secondly, uh, since these guys have such a large dipole moment, 30 to buy is what uh, was calculated. Um, some of that comes from uh, broadening from the background electric field and then the AC, the additional AC star shift. Um, so we think we understand that uh, pretty well. Um, if you you know, since these signals are small, and this data was difficult to get, um, but this kind of line is buried in here, we uh, kind of turned down our laser powers and just bit the bullet and did longer scans to, to see this state here. So this one is this guy right here, and this guy is, is that guy right there. <clears throat> so we have, uh, you know, at least four states for this uh, 31S, uh, uh, potential. And um, then for also 32S, 33S, and 34S, we see these states. And um, the calculations are shown over here. Basically, the solid lines here are the M sub J equals plus or minus one projections, and the dotted lines are the M sub J equals zero projections for the triplet state. Um, in the uh, experiments we did in Stuttgart, it was done in a magnetic trap, so you didn't see both of these uh, flavors of states. And here you do because um, we're in a dipole trap and we can have uh, all different uh, orientations. But you can see here that the lines agree pretty well uh, in all these cases with the experiment. If these were blown up, you would, it would even look a little bit better, but I wanted to show them all in one, on one figure. You can see that we only probing uh, out to, say, like 1,000 A0 and the, the signals are a little bit small. Um, one thing that's unfortunate um, here is that these guys in cesium are contracted even more. And so uh, our density of 10 to the 13th per cubic centimeter is, uh, is on the hairy edge of being able to observe these states. It would be better if we had higher density and we're working to try to make the experiment a little bit better. Um, if you remember the, the uh, um, stick our experiments, we had a little bit, the, the rubidium states existed a little bit further out, and we had higher density, so the signal to noise was a bit better, uh, better there. So we can also apply electric fields here, um, but it's uh, also not very simple because uh, the states that are forming those avoided crossings where our wells are, uh, are also sensitive to the electric fields. When we shift um, the, when we try to shift the uh, trilobite uh, peaks here, we're also changing the structure of them. And so uh, we haven't been able to do a, kind of a stark map for this particular case. Uh, here is shown like uh, several different small fields. And you can already see, for example, that this peak, which was prominent here, has kind of uh, gone away just with that small field. And we think that's because of the structural changes in the molecule. Um, however, you know, okay, so that's consistent with theory. However, we think that the um, kind of broadening of the peaks uh, is consistent with this large dipole moment, uh, in this case of 35 to buy, around 35 to buy. Um, just to kind of sum, uh, summarize uh, the stuff about the cesium trilobites, we observed vibra vibrational levels uh, for uh, to the blue side of F states for N equals 31 to 34. These guys have a giant dipole moments around 35 to buy. Uh, we observed all the spin projections or states corresponding to all 
the spin projections. And um, that uh, 35 to buy comes basically from a 1% hydrogenic character in the wave function, which is the trilobite-ness of the trilobite <laughs> molecule. And this came from a, a, a special kind of electronic structure in cesium in that uh, the uh, hydrogenic manifold is close to these S states and so that when the electron scatters, it can scatter or mix in uh, these higher angular momentum parts of the Rydberg uh, electron wave function. And um, you do need a lot of S character to detect these things or at least a lot of allowed dipole transition uh, character because uh, they're hard to excite. Um, and uh, I guess the other thing I would like to say that I don't have here is that uh, um, having even more uh, dipole character, actually having larger dipole moments, I think would have been difficult to detect these because we would have gotten dark shifting that the peaks would have spread out even more and been more dilute. And so I think that that could be a, a problem in detecting uh, the trilobite molecules that, for example, might have a kilo to buy uh, dipole moment. So I think that if you're to do an experiment like this to detect uh, kind of a pure trilobite molecule, you'd have to certainly consider that and how to do that in an experiment. Um, and then uh, the P wave scattering resonances for um, uh, the electron off of the cesium ground state atom were used for these calculations to give the good agreement between the vibrational states. Uh, of the trilobite molecules, and so this is kind of indirect um, uh, proof that those uh, theories are, are pretty accurate. Um, future directions, uh, of course, we have a lot of more work to do to explore these kind of interesting states. Um, uh, you know, we, we're working with these S-state trilobites, but we'd like to go to larger n to see maybe more electron scattering, to see more atoms inside this electron uh, cloud. And there you might get interesting um, spin exchange effects. You might be able to actually polarize ground state atoms that way. There's some old papers uh, on this uh, in the literature. Um, we still need to and want to get a little bit better handle on the electric field behavior of these molecules. Um, and then we'd like to uh, look at other states, say maybe D states, higher angular momentum states, and see how things are changing. And then also, uh, in maybe uh, relation to uh, the, the uh, workshop here, is maybe see if these could be an interme intermediate to excite ion pair states. And so this is kind of my um, cartoon drawing of speculation here um, of how one might think about exciting ion pair states. So uh, really the trilobite guys live right up here. So this is the energy level of the ground state of cesium. This is the cesium negative ion. Um, and in cesium, uh, there's some of the negative ion, there were some quasi bound states that exist up in here as excited states. They're, they're basically not stable, but they're more or less Feshbach resonances. And my question or, or my uh, thoughts would be, uh, to maybe use something, the analog of uh, photo association, to take uh, a trilobite state, which again, like I said, lives here because it's an electron scattering off one of these, right? So it's somewhere in here. Take it up to one of these window states up here, which are singlets, and then come back down here. Cesium, you know, there is singlet electron scattering off of these. Um, cesium, in fact, has a negative singlet electron scattering length, so there should be some singlet molecules that could potentially form. It's just that the singlet scattering length is very, is very small. So um, SAS calculations have shown that you don't really see bound states, or at least we're not confident of bound states that would be, that, that came out of those calculations. But in any case, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be bound. It just has to be moving slow, right? That's the idea of photo association. And so uh, maybe this uh, would work or bring up some conversation. So these are the people in my group. Arna just graduated. Richard graduated a little while ago. Um, Jonathan did, uh, and Don did most of the work here. Uh, Tillman and Robert and I still collaborate. Um, and then uh, Hossein and Seth did uh, the calculations for us here. 
And then I also have another collaborator, Luis Marcosa in, uh, in Sao Paulo. So thanks. So thank you very much for sharing with us this, this result on the second item with which to qualify. <laughs> yeah. So this is now open for discussion. So I may start with, with one. So you have this um, S state, which in an isolated atom would be totally separated from this L3 yeah. and higher. And if I understand you right, is the collision with the neutral that enables you to do a non-dipole mixing of these high yeah. Ls. So that's an octopole type interaction, or how do I have to view this? Well, I don't. Mm. Or it's just not maybe not the right way of thinking about this. Well, because it's the the center of the of the electron atom collision is not on the the point at which the angular momentum of the electron is defined in the traditional Rydberg wave function. So you could kind of think, I guess, of mixing in basis states to make that trilobite like shape, right? So you so it's coupling all the Oh, electronic wave functions that you would you need put to up the electron up. wave function at the remote point and then you re-expand in the center yeah. of your atom so and you, you get this any I mean, out. so that's kind of the way I think people okay, think no, about it. You yeah. know, yeah. So you're thinking about the Rydberg atom being excited and you're thinking about just its wave function, but it's kind of a molecular excitation. Yeah. Right. And the effect is done large in this particular system. Yeah? So because you say you, you are now uh, creating an iron pair state of character, or of iron pair state character, say 1% as opposed to 10 to the minus 4 yesterday. Yeah, yeah and that's kind of a question that I, I have too, because here, <laughs> what people might call iron, I think when people are talking about the iron pair, they're talking about this thing bound to um, basically a cesium plus ion. Mm -hmm. And this thing is stable, right? And here, the trilobites, like I said, kind of live up here in the continuum somewhere, right? And so, in so much as the electron's kind of hanging around here, maybe you could consider it something like a, a small component of like a quasi but, but, but if you remember Barry Dunning's talk, he said, I mean, he had also something similar. So you have the electron and then this little, but the cesium is this of the, he said it's a trap. You had a molecule, it's yeah. a trap for your, for your electron. And then here, you also have a trap for yeah, an electron. Yeah. And this is the same. And you also don't, you end up with an iron pair state. So I, but. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, yes, trying to put together is some of the ideas raised this morning. Uh, since this has a huge dipole moment, what if you were to try putting a little bit of 100 megahertz RF on there? Could you actually drive real vibrational transitions between the trilobite states and maybe make those peaks appear and disappear? You might be able to. I mean, I, I have to look at the, I mean, uh, what I would say is, Maybe, I guess there's not too much overlap between a lot of these states, so I don't know if, know if that would be so good, but, uh, but maybe for some of them, yeah. Um, this thing actually up here is, has kind of, the states that would be up here from these kind of curves that are coming down sharply are kind of poor, and I think here, we're able to detect these guys because um, they at least have uh, some extent and um, they're localized at long range. And now driving transitions between, for example, these two I think would be probably hard. But, um, and whether there's other states up here that we could observe, I don't know. I, I think it's interesting. Most of those wells have just one or two levels, I guess. Yeah, and then kind of you get these, this is a deeper well that comes down here that's, you know, we can't get because it's too far in. You know, we don't have enough atom pairs really there to excite them.
Um, at least we don't see anything from there, and the, combined with the Frank Condon factors. Um, so, you know, the fact that these guys are localized means you're taking a cut out of the pair distribution. You know, only pairs that you find during your excitation time that are at this kind of separation in kind of a classical picture are the ones that you're going to be allowed to excite. So um, you take kind of a hit there. And how do you define the binding energy? Because they're on the blue side, yes? So it's a... <laughs> yeah. I <clears throat> well, I mean, the binding energy is kind of where this, I guess, this asymptote comes up here. And we can't, we haven't gone up and said this is here and then gone all the way up there because this is already pretty hard to do, go this distance. But um, we might say that uh, for practical purposes, the binding energy of this would just be from, you know, the edge here down here. Because oh, this we would say after that, you know, it's kind of gone, I would say. But it, you know, the other kind of thing that's interesting about this is that we don't see um, this, uh, the analog of the RB2 plus signal in our, our spectra. And we looked for that um, quite extensively. And there could be a, that could just be that cesium is different somehow and worth thinking about. But uh, there could also be a technical reason for that. If the, so we're ionizing with the, lasers that are forming the trap in this case because we can't apply a field big enough right now to field ionize these states. Um, if uh, that CS2 is coming out of the trap very hot, so it's traveling very fast, so that it leaves this kind of 100 micron region where the atoms are trapped, then we would decrease, we would uh, be able to, we'll have a harder time measuring that signal. and. Um, we might not see it for that reason, so I wouldn't say that it's not there. But, but, but in terms of... So, so wait, wait, I'll give you the microphone. If you think about it as a sort of uh, inwards uh, pre-dissociation, uh, couldn't it simply be that the, the rate is different in... in it could be, yeah. I, I, don't, you, I guess when I... I don't know if you've looked at it uh, in terms of sort of tunneling inwards. Well, the... The tunneling time is kind of slow. Seth, I believe, calculated that. But um, as far as saying, I guess I was just saying that there could be a technical reason why we don't detect CS2+. plus. So I don't know if I would definitively say that that's not happening here. That's more my point, I think. Uh, what, what happens if you try to go to higher N? Um, we see more. Uh, we see more kind of uh, peaks close to the Rydberg state, or at least structure. But this is the region of N where we see the cleanest kind of separated peaks. Um, so we did experiments up there. In fact, uh, you could see the 39N state. And you can see kind of two features on the red side at very high laser powers. Um, and there's no pair states down there that you would expect to lead to those. This is in Rydberg, Rydberg interaction pairs. Um, so there's things up there, but it's just a bit messier. The wells are, not, are shallower, I think, and um, this blue stuff is not so distinctive. You know. And we've done experiments up to, I think, like 42 or 43, and uh, observed um, features, but we haven't assigned, uh, assigned them. This is the place where the spectra is the cleanest. And, we, uh, and this was this was uh, Seth helping us out really quite a lot to tell us where to, what states to go to. Yeah, on that note, what happens if, uh, or has anybody tried using um, other states besides S states, P states? So? I don't believe there's been any try to use higher angular momentum states yet. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, you'll have different, you have different components for the D state, and so it's just more complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and these things are really pretty hard to observe. <laughs> it's a pretty small signal. 
the spectra takes like about two or three days to do. It's every, if everything's working in the right way. So I see no further questions. So before closing this session, there are two things uh, I would still like to do. The, the first one is uh, I hope